Welcome back to Cardiades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. In this video, we're going to be looking at the identity theory of truth. Well, what is the identity theory of truth? Well, it's best understood as a reaction to the correspondence theory of truth, or rather a specific objection to the correspondence theory of truth. Let's take a look. So, in possibly part three of our correspondence objections, we might think of the first objection that gives rise to another theory coming from Frege. So Frege offered the following objection to the correspondence theory of truth. For the theory to work, it must either claim that the correspondence between the truth bearer and the truth maker is perfect and complete, or claim that they are distinct. And one idea is an idea, and the other is reality. The first is not as what is meant by correspondence, since it claims that an idea just is the reality. The idea doesn't correspond to something in reality, the idea just is reality. While the second makes a complete or really perfect correspondence theory impossible, Frege thus concludes that truth is simply undefinable. However, it should be clear that out of this objection could arise another theory of truth. Though Frege didn't offer an identity theory of truth, it's easy to see how such a theory could arise from the first form of the distinction, basically saying that, no, we're not talking about a correspondence theory of truth. We're actually talking about a theory of truth in which the truth maker is the same thing as the truth bearer. The identity theory of truth claims not that something is true, because it corresponds to reality, but instead something is true because it is identical to reality. Let's take a look. So this might seem strange at first, since certain truth bearers, like sentences, which are just words, not the meaning of those words, the acceptance of those words is true, seem importantly different from the things we make them represent. The sentence, the light bulb is on, seems to be importantly different from the state of affairs of the light bulb being on. It seems that the words written on a page, the light bulb is on, are not at all identical to a light bulb, which is on. One's made of ink and is on a piece of paper, the other's made of glass and wire and is plugged into a socket somewhere. They seem to not be identical to each other. They have different properties. However, what if instead we take a different truth bearer, like judgments or even propositions? Would this resolve the problem? It seems that while the words the light bulb is on are not identical to the light bulb being on, maybe the meaning of the light bulb is on is just that the light bulb is on. Or in other words, the proposition the light bulb is on is just identical to the state of affairs of the light bulb being on. So a relatively weak version of this identity theory, which uses judgments as truth bearers, is known as primitivism. Under this position, a judgment is the relation of a person to the proposition such that the proposition consists in the very things the judgment is about. In other words, if I were to judge that the light bulb is on, then I would be in a relationship with some entity, a proposition that's the unity of an object and a property, namely a light bulb which is instantiating the property of being on. Under this conception, the proposition that I am judging to be true just is identical to the state of affairs in the world. The only meaning of my judgment is just that state of affairs in the world. There's nothing more or less than the state of affairs, not some mysterious proposition meaning hanging out there in the world. The problem is that this has not told us what makes a judgment true as opposed to false. We don't have necessary and con sufficient conditions for truth. We may have offered a theory of judgments, perhaps, but we cannot offer a theory of truth since false judgments are made of actual objects in the world as well, just as often as not. 
the primitivist solves this problem by saying that truth is simply an undefinable property of some judgments, but not others. Basically, my judging that the light bulb is on being true is just undefinable. We can't say that that judgment is true as opposed to false for some specific reason. It just is. It's not a terribly satisfying solution, as it doesn't really tell us what truth is. But it will allow for us to avoid some of the problems with our identity theory of truth. However, clearly, as the name of the position suggests, a primitivist is not necessarily the best position or the most appealing position out there, because it leaves truth to be a primitive concept that we don't offer a definition of, we just describe in terms of other ideas. Bertrand Russell attempted to save the identity theory from primitivism by doing away with propositions and having the relation of judging exist between a person and multiple objects that are in the world. In this way, Russell hoped that he could present truth as jo those judgments that bore the correct relation to the objects in the world. Now, there's a debate as to whether or not this project was successful in defeating kind of the problems of primitivism and actually giving us reasons to think that certain judgments are true while others are false. But even if it's successful, it can't be an identity theory of truth. It's instead a correspondence theory of truth, which is what Russell eventually adopted, since the judgment contains the relation of judging while the world does not. The judgment inherently needs the relation of judging to help to distinguish between those things that are true and those things that are not, but the world can't contain such a relation. Therefore, they merely correspond the judgment and reality. The judgment is not identical to reality. Basically, if you judge that the light bulb is on, that means that you are in relation with the property of being on and the light bulb. You're in the judging relation with those things in the world. Whether or not this can avoid primitivism is up for debate. The point is that it cannot be an identity theory of truth, since what is true is the relation of judging, not the objects in the world themselves. The reality is not true. The truth maker is not the truth bearer. So at best, this is a correspondence theory. Of truth. Others have attempted to rescue this theory without resorting to either primitivism or a correspondence theory of truth. Perhaps the best way to separate true and false proposition is to distinguish between facts and states of affairs. We talked a little bit about facts and states of affairs in the previous video on correspondence theories of truth. Here we're going to talk a little bit about them more and about a certain way to distinguish between them. So in this theory, a fact is just a state of affairs that obtains is true in this world. So we have propositions that are identical to states of affairs that exist whether or not they obtain. And these propositions are made true if the state of affairs obtains. So once again, it's an identity theory because the propositions don't correspond to states of affairs. They're just identical to states of affairs that obtain. And one could say that the thing that distinguishes this from primitivism is that we can say is something true or not because the true ones are the states of affairs that do obtain and the false ones are the ones that don't. Here, the light bulb is on because the state of affairs of the light bulb being on obtains, while the state of affairs of the light bulb being off does not obtain. And yet, it seems that all this theory has done is kicked the can of a primitive concept one step down the road from truth to obtaining. This kind of view is just really primitivism in disguise, since there's no more a way here to define which state of affairs obtain and which do not than there was to define which judgments are true and which ones are not. So perhaps then we want to solve the problem by resorting to something known as disjunctivism. So, this claims that truth bearers and falsehood bearers are importantly different in kind. They're not the same type of thing. Things that bear truth and things that bear falsehood are different kinds of things. Usually, truth bearers are conceived of as facts, while bearers of falsehood are conceived of something else entirely for 
the disjunctivist. Basically, the property of something being true is simply identical to the property of that thing being a fact, while the property of something being false is just identical to the property of that being whatever we take as the bearers of falsehood, perhaps anti-facts or what have you. If you need to tell if something is true or false, you simply need to find out what kind of thing it is we're talking about, if it's a fact or something else, an anti-fact. So the statement the light bulb is on is true because it's identical to some fact, while the statement the light bulb is off is identical to something completely different, like an anti-fact. Yet, there's some problems that the disjunctivist is going to have to deal with here. It seems that if I've left my house and I believe truly the lights in my house are on, that if then, unbeknownst to me, the power goes out and all the lights are off, that the target of my belief does not in some way change in kind. It doesn't seem that the thing that is in my head has changed in type. Perhaps it is no longer true, but it doesn't seem the type of thing that I believe is different. It seems that the properties of that thing that I believe have changed, but the type of thing that I believe is still the same type of thing. My belief has not changed categories, unbeknownst to me. Likewise, one might worry about the modal status of falsehood. Surely there is some possible world in which the lights in my house are off, but does that make such a claim in some way of a different kind from its false counterpart in the actual world, even though the two statements, the lights in my house are off and the lights in my house are off, are identical, yet they are of a different kind simply because they exist in different worlds? That seems curious. It's important to note here that modality is going to play an important role in these theories in the sense that it can't be used to allow for non-obtaining states of affairs to exist in other possible worlds because you could have non-obtaining states of affairs about logical truths. I go into that a little bit more in the previous video. It's just important to note that that applies here as well. And finally, the definition of exactly what kind of entity the falsehood bearers are is still open to question, which will require a very exact, specific answer that doesn't mean we're letting strange things into our ontology by allowing for these weird falsehood bearers. So another take, then, on the identity theory, because disjunctivism seemed to have its problems, is the idealist theory of identity, or comes from an idealist perspective. Idealism, if you don't know in philosophy, is the position that the only states are mental states. So all of our physical states are actually mental. To some degree, everything's in your mind, or someone's mind. We're going to go into idealism a little bit more when we talk about the coherence theory of truth, but I wanted to touch on it here in identity because there is a theory that some have claimed is an identity theory that deals with idealism. It's presented by F.H. Bradley, who presents the view in the following way. According to Bradley, there is only one true judgment, and all other judgments can be measured in truth by comparing them to that judgment. This one true judgment Bradley's talking about basically encompasses everything in the world. It's just a really, really long judgment that arguably would encompass every position of every possible thing in the world and every statement that could be made and is true. There's only one judgment that's fully true because it's the only judgment that encompasses all of those different things. So if we say the light bulb is on, it may appear to be true, but for Bradley, it's only partly true since it divorces the light bulb from the wires it's connected to, and the electricity from the larger grid it is on, and those things from the context in which they exist, and so on and so forth. The only thing that can be true for Bradley is something that encompasses everything. But we wouldn't call this statement, the light bulb is on, false, just only partly true, since the light bulb being on is only part of the larger true judgment. Bradley thinks that he can account for falsehood then in the following way. Since a judgment is more true the more identical it is to reality, therefore it is more false the more different it is from reality. 
So the light bulb is off is more false and less true than the light bulb is on, since the former is less identical to reality than the latter. Rather, it there's more in common with the one true judgment which encompasses everything. Namely, because in that long list of true facts about the world that is the one true judgment, there includes the light bulb in this specific location is on, as opposed to the light bulb in this specific location is off. And yet, even a complete judgment that describes all of reality is still infected with a wisp of falsehood, since it's not identical to the judgment that, in fact, is reality. It merely describes reality. It's important to note that the perfect judgment is one that simply is reality. This is why we're in idealism, not materialism or being unbiased as opposed to materialism or idealism. The point is the judgment that is true, that's completely true, just is reality. That's the state of affairs that is. It doesn't describe it. Beyond the standard concerns that might accompany idealism, you might have some other worries about Bradley's theory of truth. You might be uncomfortable with degrees of truth, especially when it seems that almost nothing is completely true. That seems concerning. We seem to think that we say true things all the time, and completely true things all the time. And yet, according to Bradley, in fact, we never say completely true things unless we say the one true judgment that encompasses all of reality. It also seems unclear as how false something can get. Is the statement, Zeus is the son of Dionysus, more false than the light bulb is off, since the former refers to things that don't exist? How false can something be? Are judgments about impossible things, like round squares, more false than judgment about things that like unicorns that are not impossible but still don't exist. The intuition with this objection is that, sure, the light bulb is off may be false, but the light bulb still exists and is therefore in some way part of that complete judgment. And the parts of a unicorn perhaps exist, like a horse and a horn, even though the whole combination of a unicorn doesn't exist. But round and square, they do exist, but they're impossible to have together. Is Are there degrees of falsehood in this way? Also, there's another kind of objection that comes along with this, which goes along the lines of, if you listed a bunch of true statements, how is that more true than any one of those statements individually? It seems strange that if I said, there are three light bulbs in this room that are on, and there is a light bulb in this room that is on, that in some way the first statement was more true than the second? That just seems weird to my intuition. You might have a different intuition and therefore be more open to Bradley's idealist picture. Furthermore, when you get to the actual single truth, it seems to stop being something that is really even true, since it's in fact identical to reality. It seems strange to say that the one thing that is true is just reality itself. But perhaps if you already have the intuition of really a true identity theorist, this is exactly what you're looking for. A theory in which there's no difference between the truth maker and the truth bearer. There's a big debate as to whether Bradley actually holds an identity theory of truth or his description is in fact a version of the coherence theory of truth because it's so common for the coherence theory of truth to line up with an idealist metaphysics. Check out the next video on the coherence theory of truth for more about this position. Julian Dodd makes the distinction between two kinds of identity theory, robust and moderate, and he's going to offer something that I classify as a deflationist identity theory. Robust theories take separate truth bearers and truth makers and try to show how they are the same thing. Basically, they take things that are different and try to show that they're identical. But moderate theories do not actually define truth or falsehood. They merely identify facts with true thoughts. What does that mean? Well, Dodd thinks that the problem with robust theories is that they'll just always devolve into correspondence theories when backed into a corner because they, at the end of the day, are already taking two different things and trying to push them together and make them the same. He claims that his modest theory has no such problem. But as my title suggests, this is just going to end up being a deflationist theory of truth in disguise, if not a primitivist theory, since it doesn't actually define truth. I don't want to get into it too much here. We're going to talk a lot about 
deflationist theories in an upcoming video, so stay tuned for that. Another approach to the identity theory of truth is going to be called quietism. The quietist describes truth in terms of a way of thinking. If you are thinking truly, the truth you are thinking about is the case. In other words, if you truly think that the light bulb is on, then it is the case that the light bulb is on. For the quietist, like the deflationist, any talk of truth makers and truth bearers leads to a correspondence theory of sorts. Whenever we start distinguishing the truth makers from the truth bearers, we end up with a correspondence theory. When we have a thought that is true, we are simply thinking whatever we're thinking is the case. It does not correspond to some fact of the matter. The true thought simply is the case. It's kind of making truth more of a property of a thought than making it something of a separate entity that we have to define. And yet, just as with the previous theory that shunned the distinction between truth makers and truth bearers, quietism is going to risk falling into deflationism or primitism because it doesn't really define truth. And unlike the deflationist, quietism think that truth plays a role in meaning, but that's possibly the sole difference in some way. So there's a big danger that quietism is just a kind of deflationism or primitivism in disguise. And really the specter of primitivism is going to loom even larger to the point of engulfing the theory because we don't define truth. We offer it as a primitive concept, which is why primitivism really has its name. We simply explain it in terms of its relation to other concepts. Your thinking truly just means that what you're thinking about is the case. We don't tell you what thinking truly actually means or what the necessary and sufficient conditions for it would be. Simply put, a comprehensive identity theory of truth has not yet been achieved. Attempts to create one inevitably fall into primitivism, deflationism, or correspondence theory of truth. As Odysseus attempted to sail between the many-headed monster Scylla and the mighty whirlpool Charybdis, if an identity theory is ever to succeed, it must find some middle ground between deflationism, primitivism, and correspondence. If you think you have such a theory, offer it in the comments below. But with that, that is the identity theory of truth. Next up, we're going to be looking at coherence theories, followed by pragmatism, deflationary theories, pluralist theories, Tarski, Kripke, revision theories, and finally, the two truths of Tibet. If you want more information on the identity theory of truth, check out the identity theory of truth on the SEP. A lot of information in this video was derived from there. Watch this video and more here at Carnities.org and stay skeptical, everybody.